One thing that I've always found interesting about camera lenses, especially Canon ones, since they tend to be the ones who use this, is that there are fluorite elements in many of their big white lenses. And I always thought it was so interesting that they grow synthetic calcium fluorite crystals to use them as optical elements in their lenses. And I just thought that was so neat and I've always wanted to see one of them in person. The problem is they are all in their L-series lenses and they're all very expensive. So there aren't many options to actually see one of the fluorite elements. They do appear in microscope objectives. The Zeiss one, for example, has it. But I mean, look how big that piece of glass is. We'll never see it. Another option is the Canon PowerShot Pro 1, which uses a fluorite element in it. But that whole lens system is quite small. So I think the fluorite in that would be pretty small. And besides, I love my Canon Pro 1. So uh, to get started, I bought some calcium fluorite crystals. This one I even kind of polished on one side for no real reason. And I just really wanted to see what, what it looked like. And it, it's pretty cool if you uh, get some natural fluorite. It's got a bit of, bit of color to it. You can see there's nice striations, at least on these ones. Some purples, some blues some greens so yeah it's a pretty neat mineral and it's very common but what to do about finding a lens that uses it that is not super expensive and I won't feel bad for destroying it because I want to see inside well it turns out that the Canon video lens 20 times zoom XL blah 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 is one of the few Canon lenses that has fluorite and is basically useless. This lens only works on the Canon XL camcorders. There's the XL1 and the XL2. The XL1 is notable for shooting 28 days later. Other than that, it's a pretty limited camcorder by today's standards. I mean, they're standard def only. You can only use these lenses on this, the, on the XL series. You can't use them on anything else. They absolutely will not adapt to anything. So don't think, oh, you can adapt this to my digital SLR. Oh my God, a 5.4 to 108 millimeter lens. That's amazing. Yeah, except for the fact that there's like a nine times crop factor on this. <laughs> Because the image sensor size is so tiny, the circle of image that this produces is extremely small. So even on something like, let's say you're using a Sony a7R4, which is 61 megapixels, you'd seriously get like five megapixels worth of image. If that, you're much better off using a real lens, something designed for it. And one of the biggest problems is, notice how there's no light coming through there? That's because the aperture closes completely when the power is off on this lens. So you'd have to also reverse engineer it. I, I tried powering it up um, using some kind of established pinouts, but that's for the EF mount. This uses the XL mount, which no one has reverse engineered because there's no point. But I tried just powering it up, hoping that, that the aperture blades would just open up when it received power, but unfortunately it didn't do that. So I guess that's just not an option. Would have been neat to at least demonstrate how useless the lens would be on a modern camera. That being said, this lens is very nice as far as a standard def lens goes. This pretty much has all the stuff in it that I'd want to see. It's a complex zoom lens, so there's going to be tons of optical elements in it. It's got a ND filter, a multi, I, well, I believe it's two separate ND filters that click into place. The zoom and focus systems are completely focused and zoomed by wire, so these are just purely electrical contacts. There's no physical movement of the lens. You can set zoom and focus presets so that you can just hit this one button and it'll just zoom right to it or focus right to it. So you can do nice pulls. And it's got a fairly large front element. I think this is, yeah, 72 millimeter. And like uh, Canon EF lenses, it's a bayonet mount with a full electrical interface, which is 
totally different from the EF mount. The EF mount's much larger than this. Aside from being a complex optical construction, it also has fluorite, and it's also got an image stabilizer, and it should be like an early generation one that probably uses a gyroscope. So it should be a pretty interesting design in the lens. And I don't know what these things cost originally, but I'm sure this lens was not cheap, like in the multi-thousand dollar range. I'm well aware that the fluorite glass is probably just going to look like regular glass. I'm, I'm already prepared to be disappointed that, by that. If it does look exactly like it, I, I've read that it it's susceptible to UV light and it will fluoresce. So maybe we can identify it. I'm not holding out hope. It may just be, I have no idea which one the fluoride is. Now I've already taken apart the top and the bottom sections of this lens once already, just to get a little peek inside, see if there is anything obvious I could uh, try and power up for the aperture control. But I did put it back together. This first piece, which is just held in with a few screws, has the first optical element. And this appears to be, I'm not sure if it's wedged in or glued in, but I'm gonna try and take out each piece of glass so we can take a look at it. It turned out it was just a little compression ring made out of metal that is holding in this single element. And there we go, that's the biggest, well, presumably the largest piece of glass on this uh, lens. Ooh. Now we're starting to see a lot of the electronics and some of the motors. So there's a main PCB there with a secondary one. This looks like it's just a little interconnect board with possibly an optional switch there. Little metal tabs and we'll remove the mount. The mount does have a piece of glass here. I believe this is not part of the optical formula and it's simply there to prevent any air from being sucked in every time you zoom in and out. When you're, when you're moving all the lens elements, it'll create a vacuum and it tends to suck in dust. So on many lenses, they'll put a big chunk of uh, glass that's not technically part of the optical formula. It's just a clear piece of glass and they'll just put that on the end to just keep the dust out. This piece was held in with a little bit of uh, silicone or glue or something, but either way, a little bit of hot air took that right out. There are just a few screws holding in these little PCBs, so these should all just pop out. This board's strictly just an interconnect board, although, like I said, it looks like there's space for a, a push button or something, but nothing's fitted on it. This component looks like it's either a focus sensor or possibly a white balance sensor. It's probably a phase detect focusing unit of some type. Uh, we'll see where the optical path goes. Maybe uh, it's deflecting some light into it. And there's also a little uh, photo transistor there. When I first took this apart, I noticed that this whole section seems to be on a couple axes where it can move. So I'm suspecting this is the image stabilization element and it's just kind of locked in place right now. Because there's also these components here and here, obviously controlling something to do with the axis. So I suspect this is all due to the IS system. These pieces look like they're just pieces of metal used to form end stops. There might actually be bearings in there. Well, that loosened this component up, but it doesn't seem to be freeing the lens at all. One thing that always amazes me about camera technology, especially uh, both lenses and cameras, is the complexity of the flex cables. They're always way crazy. Unfortunately, there's really no information on these lenses at all online. Couldn't even find any information on how many optical elements are in them. I mean, they, they came out in the early 2000s, so they're not super old. I'm surprised there's not more detail on it. So there's definitely a little opening here for this sensor. So this must be what's handling the focusing system. I'm pretty sure this is an off sensor phase detect focusing unit. Although I have seen on some other lenses that they call it a piezo focusing system, which I've never heard of. The only information I can find on it, it relates to modern camera lenses on smartphones. This is the long worm gear that drives the zoom system. It reaches way into the 
the lens itself. So I'm just gonna pull this off so it's not in the way. On this side, it's hard to see right now. Uh, we'll get further in this white piece. Looks like it's a rotating cam lock of some type to lock this whole element in place. So presumably this is what moves into place when the power is disconnected. Well, that was pretty obvious. These pins just come out. These pins provide the rotating axis. Okay, I got these four pins out. They're a little tricky because they're actually greased up and quite small and recessed. Okay, so this has two optical elements on it. Ooh. And it's in this little bellows arrangement so that these, these can move separately. So this bottom one is fixed and then this whole top section can compensate for any movement. Now on modern cameras, they still use this. Optical image stabilization in a lens is not uncommon. You can see it distort as I move. But they've also moved to in-camera sensor stabilization, such as my camera, I have an A6500 from Sony. It will move its sensor to compensate, which is cool because it applies to every lens you connect to it. So I can hook up a lens from like 1971 and it actually stabilizes it, which is pretty cool. So I don't know if I can get this section apart easily. I might have to just cut it. Okay, I was seriously not expecting this. I started to take this apart with an X-Acto knife by cutting this section. It's filled with liquid. Isn't that crazy? Similar to using microscope oil when you're looking at very fine objects up close. That is just crazy. I have never even heard of that in a lens. I wonder if it's water. It looks oily. Yeah, it's leaving it's leaving residue on the on the glass. So this must be oil, some kind of oil. That is just nuts. I've never seen that. I've never even heard of that. So I successfully removed one of the elements. This happens to be the first one. It is a very very elaborate system with a lot of glue and gaskets and stuff. I mean, you can't blame them. They have to keep that oil in. So there's this plastic inner ring that's a spacer and it also is what has the bellows attached to it. Glue underneath it in spots. A piece of glass has the bellows actually glued to it in parts as well with kind of like a metal foil. There we go. I just need to clean the glass a bit more. After a lot of scraping, I got pretty much all of it off this one too. Although uh, there is a little ring of like glue or something that doesn't want to come off so construction of this looks like it's been melted into the plastic or possibly even formed around it so I'm going to try and just heat this up and see if I can just take out the element it looks like this is all one piece of plastic and there doesn't seem to be a gap anywhere along here so I think this is a solid outer piece it does look like this is a viable way to get into this this one piece of glass especially at the beginning is very thick at least a few millimeters so I'm just gonna keep heating this up and peeling this back it didn't take too long to melt away all this plastic it's a pretty tough plastic I think it's glass filled but what's really nice is it just peels right off the glass it doesn't stick to it at all so I did discover that there are three elements in this section, starting with this very large one that has kind of a brown tinge to it on the edge. I was thinking it was a side effect of the plastic, but this one does not have it. So it might be some kind of different optical glass. I don't think it's the fluorite simply because the element's huge. There's a few smaller elements coming up deeper in the lens that I can see, and I assume that one of those is gonna be the fluorite. I think they're trying to avoid very large fluorite elements because it's so expensive to manufacture. The second piece, which has a major curve to it, this piece is actually in a spherical element where it's not like it's cut out of a curve. It's a compound angle. You can see it goes in here. It's hard to tell because it's, um. It's, uh, it's clear, obviously, but these seem to be both aspherical elements. All right, moving right along, I removed a couple screws at the base of the moving section. It's just a little metal piece to block out the light. As for the rest of this, I figured out the trick to getting this off is if you cut the rubber off, there's a hole. So there are actually some hidden screws. 
This is actually fairly typical on camera lens design. I've run into this a few times. You always forget about it until the last second though. There we go. That's some more progress. Oh, so it's all metal in here. I was thinking it really feels plasticky on the outside. It's all just uh, aluminum. These are all the components of the image stabilization system. There's a motor here, presumably to run some component of it. Oh no, sorry, that's to run this little cam lock. See, this is what was holding those two elements, which were filled with the oil in place. And this should come off somehow. Okay, so there's screws in here. This section only contains this one motor for the, uh, the aforementioned cam. Oh, wow, there's quite a gear down on that. You can hear that motor just going crazy. And this part is just an encoder. So that's just gonna be reading the focusing position or zoom. I keep, I keep calling it one or the other, but um, I'm not actually sure which one it is. Some lenses are, um, like generally, the zoom ring is the closest to the camera and the focusing ring is on the outside, but that changes from lens to lens. As for the ring, it's simply just the tooth gear and a piece of metal. So I've made some progress on figuring out how the image stabilization system works. It consists of two duplicated units, one for the X and the Y, and there's a magnet in here and a coil. So this allows it to stabilize itself against the magnet. This really complex flex cable is what interconnects to the solenoid. There's also a little um, micro switch for this uh, cam unit. And then there's, I think these are photo interrupters, but it's kind of hard to tell. It's all packed in there pretty tightly and there's actually a couple connections in. So I think it is just a, a photo interrupter. The image stabilizer control board consists of these two units, which must be some kind of piezoelectric device. I've never seen an accelerometer like this before. I mean, it's not a spinning gyro like the first generation units but they're still quite large. I mean, it's obviously not just like a modern MEMS one. Either way, there's not much on this other than a few support chips and presumably a motor driver or something. There's two variable resistors, one marked Y and one marked P, presumably pitch and yaw. Now, I wasn't able to find any information on this particular part. From the looks of things, there's four separate connections going along the center core. So I'm gonna say this is almost definitely a piezoelectric accelerometer around some kind of, looks like it might be a ceramic core. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty much almost certainly what it is, unless it's some kind of strain gauge. I mean, it also looks like a strain gauge, so it's kind of hard to tell, especially since I can't find any information on that part or on this part. Looks like there's a raised PCB there. So let me break away the plastic housing. With the casing removed, this is all that's left. On this one side, it's just the connections to the sensor. And on this side, there's a TB111. The only thing I could find information on is a saw filter, but I have no way of really knowing if that's what they're using for it. It could be a normal component in one of these, but I'm not quite sure. It looks almost like this is conformal coated and this looks like it's been laser trimmed it's actually got a really interesting pattern in there this one little surface mount device it must be a laser trimmed resistor of some type because this one looks like it's also been laser trimmed in some way there's a four pin connection to the board with this device here's the one that's still intact i might just pull this off the board and keep it just because it's pretty unusual and interesting I figured out why this plastic is so damn tough, especially when I was melting it with a hot air gun. Polycarbonate, 20% carbon fiber, 10% glass fill. The rest of this should be pretty straightforward. Looks like these screws just remove this last metal piece. And I can remove the other adjustment ring. There's a ground connection to this piece. All right, I figured it out. You have to rotate this section. Then this comes off. This is just a 
nicely machined piece of aluminum. And one of the other adjustment rings, presumably the zoom ring. Just a plastic geared ring. And there's this last section of plastic, which I'm going to take off because I can already see it's covered in grease. Yeah, this is simply just a piece of plastic with a, uh, a little rotary sensor. And this is just adjusting the ND filter selection. All right, finally to the main PCB, I can get this last screw off. So it looks like there's a decent amount of processing on this. So it is possible they are in fact doing the autofocusing directly on the lens itself, which is an interesting approach. I just had another filming light delivered. So I'm using the small USB one, which uh, I think helps quite a bit. Evens out the light because I have a really big light above me and a couple smaller ones on the sides, but uh, it tends not to be super even just because that one big light is just so bright. This is the main zooming assembly. Looks like there is again two, possibly three elements. There's just three optical sensors here, and that's probably just checking the location of the ND filter. So there's definitely a bit of weight down here. So this is gonna have quite a bit of stuff in it. I can see quite a few components in there. I noticed there was a section that had a little bit of tape over it. I took that off, I can't really see what it's covering up. But this is clearly the aperture control. And there's some covers on some other things, so just dig all this out first. That is covering up nothing. It's actually probably just preventing light leaks from certain components. There must be a big motor in here. A lot of things are sticking to this. Well, I can already see one of the ND filters. Big magnets. And then this rotates. Okay, so that's what's moving the ND filters into place. Another element, and then there's another one on the back. Possibly more in between. It looks like there's quite a big cavity in there. <laughs> this is the uh, ND filter arrangement. Yeah, it just moves them both in. One is 132 and the other one I think was 1 8th. So one is a lot darker than the other. Nice little copper bearings and pins. You can definitely see how much darker the one on the right is compared to the one on the left. And I'm not sure if it uses both in conjunction. And I don't, I'm not sure if these are glass. They might actually just be a little plastic yeah, these are just plastic. It does not want to move with that installed. Let me see if I can just remove just this. With the solenoid disconnected, this actually, you can actually get this to open and close. Not many blades, only six. Compared to a modern lens, it's pretty minimal. Unlike most camera lenses, this thing actually closes all the way. I've been fortunate so far in that in all of my repairs of lenses, I haven't had to actually open up an aperture and repair it because these things look like a total nightmare. I mean, these things are, the uh, blades are so thin and cleaning them, even just cleaning it assembled is just, ugh, it freaks me out having <laughs> thinking about doing that. So yeah, they just pivot around these little pin locks on the side and that's it. This might be additional voice coils for the focusing system because the single worm gear I took out won't run both the focusing and the zoom mechanism. So it's possible these are some kind of fancy linear motors. One more lens section with looks like two more elements. I gotta keep these all in order so I can piece it together later. Now, as for these motors, wow, these are pretty impressive magnets. So the focusing system uses these fancy voice coil actuators. These are 
quite beefy, but you can tell by all the screws it's picking up. Yeah, it's all glued together. Oh, wait, there's a screw there. Oh, no, it's not hooked up to anything. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I can pry this apart or if it's been glued. Okay, that's not so bad. So yeah, these are just pretty straightforward magnets and they're quite powerful. There's just two coils and this component. So this looks like it's just a little piece of glass. Huh, I'm not sure what they're using that optical sensor for. It must be some kind of directional device to figure out where where it's focused on it. Nothing else in here except the wiring for the two coils. I think there's just two elements in this one as well. And this last section just has a few pins for the linear movement of the focusing system. And a, again, a very complicated piece of expensive plastic. Taking a look at the board, yeah, there's the two main chips and a whole bunch of support chips. Again, this will be all motor drivers and stuff handling the image stabilization. This whole bunch of protection circuitry and you know capacitors and whatnot for the motors and solenoids a whole bunch of test pads and these are probably all drivers of some type pretty straightforward uh, these chips yeah good luck finding any information on them it's usually pretty hard to find information on stuff like this because it's usually in-house stuff or at least custom parts made for the purpose a bit of power supply components so i've taken out all the lenses from the plastic like i said before that plastic is great for getting the glass out it just does not stick to it at all you can just heat it up and peel them right out uh, it turns out there's a couple doublet elements so there's two pieces of glass stuck together this one and this one uh, there might be one more so all together there are 16 pieces of glass not counting the plastic nd filters so there's it's a 16 element design I'm not sure if when manufacturers count lens elements, they count the like just kind of plain pieces of glass that are in included. So right off the bat, you can see that there's a few elements that are black on the edge. That's just because they've got a plastic coating that I didn't scrape off altogether. The two pieces of glass used in the oil section for the image stabilizer are quite a bit bluer than the rest of the pieces. It almost looks like it's just plain glass, whereas these look like optical glass. It's rare that I see the kind of picture frame glass style, just plain glass inside a lens, but I'm sure it's optical glass of some type. And it looks like there's two spherical elements. I believe this one is in fact the fluorite element. I'm not positive, but it seems to be the only one that fluoresces under UV light. So if I just cut all the lighting, so if we hit my light, see, only one of them fluoresces and you can get, a, there's a little bit of fluorescence on the natural fluorite, but this particular element is the only one that's actually fluorescing. So I think we have a winner. Yeah, you can see all the bits of crap that's come, like the grease and crap that's come out of this thing on my hands. Pointless side note, my ESD safe WIA screwdrivers, the tips really fluoresce under UV light. Well, I hope you enjoyed that teardown as much as I did. I thoroughly enjoyed getting to look into a L series piece of glass. Luckily one that cost me 30 bucks instead of thousands. I've always been curious about these fluorite elements and this whole oil filled design, that, that was just really cool. I was not expecting that at all. They must use it so that these two pieces of glass act as one solid element. It's essentially just merging it all together into one large piece of glass that can adjust. So that is really cool. I've never seen that. I don't know if they still use that in modern designs. I really doubt it. So if you're interested in getting one of these, they're pretty readily available on eBay. They're usually overpriced, but they're really not worth that much money. If you have any complaints about me destroying a camera lens that you could have used or anything like that, don't bother posting them. I don't care. If you wanted the lens, go buy one. They're cheap and they're useless, so have fun. Go buy an XL camera and you can buy as many of these lenses as you want and build a shrine for them. This one I wanted to see inside. <laughs> now you don't have to.